States. I want to bring in Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, who is a was a no vote, one of the 26, I believe, no votes on there. And in your statement, Senator Graham, you you put it on the trigger. You put it on this issue of Pentagon cuts That's on philosophical. Uh, yeah. points. Every other part of it, you said you feel as if, wait a minute, we've gone too far on this. Well, I think, you know, you're a good political analyst. This is a philosophical shift for the Republican Party. The Republican Party has been about two things uh, since I've been around, a limited government and a strong national defense. And I cannot imagine Ronald Reagan exposing the Defense Department yeah. to the sequestration trigger provisions. So I'm all for lower taxes. But this is a philosophical shift for the Republican Party saying defense spending is not the most important part of the budget anymore. It is of lesser importance, and that disturbs well, me. The, is it, well, Senator, then I, but isn't that the point of a trigger? That you want to put something above the heads of those folks on Super Congress, uh, whatever not we want really. to call the Super Committee, but you want to put that they, so that they don't pull it. Well, here's, here, here's why I don't want to play games with men and women in the uniform. Every Democrat, Republican, and Independent should want a strong national defense in a time of great danger. So by putting the Defense Department on the table and subjecting it to $600 billion in cuts above what's already being proposed is irresponsible and is not a good motivator. It's a demoralizing event to our men and women in uniform. And I quite frankly think from a Republican point of view, a philosophical shift that I do not want to, be, to, to have any part of. Would you have preferred then a, a trigger? I mean, and the idea of these is you, know you want to create I motivation. You know would you have taken Chuck? one that would have been with taxes then? Uh, the AMT was one that was thrown out there. Let me tell you about taxes. I don't want to raise rates, but I've been in the camp that if you close the ethanol subsidy, Chuck, it's four billion, it's not much. I would take some of the money to cut, buy down tax rates, but I'd also take some of the money to pay down debt. I, from my point of view, closing loopholes and deductions and paying down debt with the money is a good use of the money. So I'm not in the camp that you can't ever have revenues to solve our national debt problem, but I don't want to raise rates. But here's the big thing for me, the agreement is putting out a fire. The only thing Congress is capable of is putting out a fire. We had a debt limit, a debt ceiling limit fire. We put it out, that's good news. Boehner did well with his conference. McConnell did well with his, Harry did well. But we haven't moved the needle much. We're gonna add $7 trillion in debt. The government still grows and we put the Defense Department at unnecessary risk. So that's why I voted no. All right, Senator, I don't want to say anything. I want Andrea Mitchell wants to get a question in. Just one quick question, Senator. Yes, Thanks. Uh, uh, on the subject of taxes, uh, Senator McConnell was quoted as saying that nobody from his side would be appointed who is open to any kind of tax increase to the super committee, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if you're setting that bar from the Republican right. side at the, uh, the get-go, you're going to get closer conceivably to uh, a division on that committee and meet, I, having to I, deal I, with those triggers. I, I, and I think Democrats are going to put people on the committee that are not going to erode entitlements. They're not going right. to jeopardize exactly. Social right. Security and Stalemate. Medicare. This is why I think the whole thing is going to not withstand scrutiny. Well, here's what I would have liked to see. The average length of time we've uh, extended the debt ceiling since 1940 was nine months. What I would have done as a Republican say, Mr. President, we'll give you the average time, nine months, we'll pay for it dollar for dollar, and we'll continue this debate. President Obama is sleeping pretty good last night and tonight because he now has a clear path to January 2013 where you don't have to deal with this issue anymore. So in that regard, he was a winner. Senator, I've talked to a lot of, of your colleagues over the last couple of weeks who were not in the negotiations, who even ones that were in Gang of Six who felt as if their, their own leadership wasn't taking them seriously. Yeah. It, was there a, how bad is this disconnect between leadership and, uh, <laughs> and the rank and file meaning you weren't right. able to do all these other things you guys have been wanting to do these last six weeks. Well, you know, it's, people would call me up at home and say, what's going on? Like, I'm in the room. I said, I don't know. I read the paper and I watch MSNBC <laughs> and Fox like everybody else. But you know That's what? Right. You can't have 535 people negotiating. I don't blame the leadership for having to try to find common ground and do a big deal. I'm sorry the big deal didn't happen. But the lesson to be learned here from our leadership 
is that you need to listen to members. These new members, Ron Johnson spent $9 million of his own money to come to Washington. Mm -hmm. He's been arguing for a strategy for two months. And what we did is let the clock run out, like the CR, like the lame duck, get your back up against the wall and make irrational decisions and you don't have much to show for it. A lot of new members say you couldn't run a business that way, so they're frustrated. So if I was a congressional leader, I would go back to my caucus when we come back in September and listen a little closer. You know, uh, there's a whole list of things that didn't get done that I was told we're going to get done, whether it's yeah. a confirmation yeah. of a new Secretary of Commerce, three yeah. trade agreements, and I know that right. there's some politics on that, but I think that had gotten worked out. I mean, can yeah. you put, uh, did all of these things get tabled because of this? I think so. I, you know, uh, Syria is about to implode. Uh, you know, the one thing I worry about, when you look at this, the first two years of spending in this bill, really not much savings, but what we've done with defense is create a $684 billion number for 12, 686 for 13, but here, this is what's important. Defense has to share that money with Homeland Security, foreign operations, and veterans. And if you believe, as I do, that the way to defend America is beyond killing people and using bombs, that foreign operations account where you invest in, in people's uh, uh, well-being throughout the world, where you help allies like Egypt have a good election. That account is now competing with the Department of Defense. And one of the results of this deal is to make us Fortress America. The ability to engage the world without military using the military exclusively is going to be diminished right. here. The foreign operations account is the big loser of this whole deal, and we need to be involved in the world in a constructive fashion. Uh, well, Grover Norquist has almost bragged about the fact that there's now the Boehner rule, that no <laughs> debt ceiling increase will ever go without a dollar for dollar cut. That's is that rule. really, is that a rule that is good for the, uh, is that good policy? Well, when you're, the question, I think so, how do you get in $14.3 trillion worth of debt? Both parties have to work together to screw the government up this bad. You can't be this far in debt doing it all by yourself. So if one party's willing to break that cycle, that's a good thing. The Tea Party has brought a lot of energy to, to this whole debate about paying for things and looking at the government as being out of control. Now, I'm with the Tea Party on spending, but there's elements of the Tea Party that feel it's okay to cut a trillion dollars out of the defense budget over the next decade. I will not be with them there. So so they're right on spending. I'm yeah. not going to agree with anybody, Tea Party included, to decimate our defense needs at the time of great threat. Before I let you go, you brought up Syria, and uh, I know you follow these things as closely as anybody. What can the U.S. government do that it hasn't done with Syria right now, considering, uh, you know, this is not Libya in this right. case. Well, this is, right. this is a pretty, yeah, you right. can't do what we've been doing with NATO. You don't have the Arab world behind you as you did in Libya. You don't have the UN. But here's what here's the key to Syria is Turkey. The Turkish government came in uh, for the Transitional National Council in Libya, and that gave a lot of momentum to, to Gaddafi being isolated. Turkey is becoming a big player in the region, and I am hoping uh, that uh, the Prime Minister of Turkey will understand that his neighbor, Assad, is destroying the Arab Spring, destroying the Turkish model, and will basically side with the Syrian people. The goal is to isolate Assad in every way you can. Sanction him and isolate him in the region. And I'd love to see a coalition led by Turkey telling Assad he's got to go. And it does seem, that the, at least on the sanction front, that suddenly Everything that we've seen, and it's very hard to get pictures. I mean, all of us have, it's very hard to get into Syria. It's a lockdown, it's very similar to Iran or Korea, the way that government locks people out of that country. But it does seem as if you have the uh, European Union, Italy just pulled its ambassador, that, that maybe there yes. is a coalition, at least on the financial front. I think we're forming a coalition to isolate Assad. We should withdraw our ambassador. I know that's a very bold move. But at the end of the day, and this debt debate is long overdue. Everyone needs a strong America. We need to have a strong, economically sound America. Admiral Mullen said our national debt is one of our biggest national security threats. But here's what I'm trying to tell my colleagues. We should be investing in Egypt. This is the first chance to bring about democracy in the Arab world in 6,000 years. We're missing a great opportunity to help the Egyptian people with their election in November. Don't take your eye off the ball on the Arab Spring. That's why it's so important 
that. To get Gaddafi out of power in Libya, it would be the death blow to the Arab Spring. There is a wonderful opportunity in this world. America needs to support it. Women are now driving in Saudi Arabia, and you and Andrea know that that is no small thing. Right. So I, I just, I'm very frustrated that we're, we're not coherent as a nation to support what I think is a wonderful opportunity for change that won't last forever. All right, Senator Lindsey Graham, Republican for South Carolina. Senator, thanks for uh, thanks. rolling with us here on this. We'll see you around town. All right, sir. A Andrea Mitchell.